I'm Gene Good, and these two gentlemen sitting in the cockpit of the Super Constellation radar plane. In the pilot seat, it's pilot and commander Martin Dana. Also a pilot, but sitting in the engineer's seat at the present time, is Ed Burkan, also a commander. These two men have been flying the Pacific Barrier flights for quite some time and represent many, many flyers who have been trying to compete with the Goonie Birds on the island of Midway. Commander, I wonder why we're getting the flight crew ready for this uh, flight, if we may uh, talk with you and the commander uh, a bit about the Goonie Birds. Have you had any trouble with them out in the uh, Midway Islands? I surely have. Uh, have you actually had a collision with one? I've had quite a few. I had a real bad one the day after last Christmas. Is that right? What happened at that time, sir? I was in the right seat. Another qualified aircraft commander was actually making the takeoff. And just as we broke ground, a bird hit right about there on the pilot's windshield. The glass in these planes is a double pane of glass for safety. However, this broke the outer pane and fortunately did not break the inner pane. If the bird had hit in the center, just a few inches down from where it actually hit, as we could tell after the flight, I'm sure it would have come through and killed the pilot who did not see it until the last minute. Well, now, you were sitting over in this seat uh, with that uh, small bit of warning. Could you have uh, taken over the controls and uh, uh, made a, uh, a takeoff all right? We're always prepared to do that. We always also hope that we can do it in a situation like that. Were you flying a plane such as this uh, with the 20 crew members aboard at that time, or, or what plane? No, this was a Super Constellation transport. We had about 70 people in the back of that plane when this bird hit. Uh, we know that besides yourself and the co-pilot, or vice versa as that case was, uh, you have around 20 crew members back half. Uh, this must be quite a problem. They can't see these Goonie birds, can they? Well, they really sweat it out. When they're on the ground, they laugh and joke about it, because aviators are like that. But every time they take off and land, they know they're playing Russian roulette with these birds. Well, now, uh, Commander, you uh, not just having one uh, crew such as this, but you uh, are the exec executive officer of some 18 crews. I would imagine you have some real thoughts about these Goonie Birds. That is correct, Gene. As long as the money holds out, the maintenance squadron can repair the planes and patch up the damage. Fortunately, we haven't lost a crew yet. Nobody can replace people. That's our greatest concern. All right, well, thank you very much, uh, Commander Martin Dana. Now we'd like to talk with uh, Commander Ed Burkan. Uh, Commander, have you had having any trouble with these uh, Goonie birds yourself? Yes, I've had eight bird strikes. The last and most serious was in April this year. Sounds like bird strikes, like you're doing a lot of bombing runs, but actually they're striking you, is that right? That's right. It's uh, impossible to avoid them on takeoff. Well, now this one you're talking about in last April, what actually happened that time? Well, we had uh, developed a moderate uh, hydraulic leak from this, and we didn't know what our damage was until we were about halfway through our barrier flight. What had uh, you found out right immediately after takeoff? Would you have to abort your uh, takeoff? If we had known what the damage was uh, on takeoff, we would have aborted the flight, yes. What would have happened then? Would you have to go through some procedure in order to get your plane back in the ground? Well, it would have involved dumping 3,000 gallons of fuel before we could land. Why is this now? Well, our takeoff weight is well above our maximum safe landing weight. What is your takeoff weight with the plane loaded uh, fuel and personnel and all? We take off weighing about 140,000 pounds, and our maximum safe landing weight is 122,000. In other words, you have to burn something up before you get back down on the ground. That's right. Either burn it up or dump it over the side, and if controllability of the aircraft is involved, it would involve dumping probably as much as 6,000 gallons. 6,000 gallons. I can figure this out at 16 or 20 cents a gallon is a lot of money, besides uh, possibly losing some of the crew. Well, thank you very much, uh, sir. And thank you, uh, Commander Dana and uh, Commander Burkan. We've been talking with two pilots who represent the pilots that fly in the uh, Pacific Barrier area out of Midway, uh, who've been competing with the Goonie Birds, and I'm quite sure all of them will say just exactly as these two men have, that it is a real problem. Now let's work out to meet some of the crew members of this plane. This is Chief Aviation Machinist Mate Jerry McCann. Mac has been flying as a flight engineer in these Super Connies for about six years. Along with this, he's been flying air transport planes landing at Midway Island. So he knows all about the bird problem. Mac, I understand that you uh, took uh, one of these Goonie birds in an engine one time. Is that right? Yes, sir. That's correct. Would you like to explain what happened at that time? Well, we were in an R5D about at liftoff speed, leaving Midway en route to Honolulu when we got a bird in the carburetor air scoop. This, I imagine, would kill, a, uh, kill an engine rather quickly, would it not? 
Yes, sir. It caused a total loss of power to our number three engine. Uh, an R5D, that's a four-engine plane. Yes, sir. Uh, roughly half the weight of one of our barrier craft. Did you have to go back and land at that time? Yes, we did. Of course, this is a different type plane, and you have half the weight of this one. Uh, we're talking about the Super Connie now on the Barrier Pacific. What would actually happen uh, if you took a Goonie Bird in the air intake of one of these uh, Super Constellation uh, radar planes? I don't believe I'd be around to tell you about it. In other words, you think uh, you would uh, crash on takeoff? Is that it? Yes, I do. Would that be total loss of plane and personnel? More than likely. Fine. Most likely. And there you have it. From people who know what they're talking about. These men, men who spend about one-third of their living hours airborne, it's hard for them to understand the continued existence of the Goonie Bird here on Midway Sand Island. They maintain there are other more desirable islands nearby that could absorb with ease the bird population here. Fury Atoll, for instance, only 50 miles from Midway, it is almost void of nesting goonies. This is due to an overall covering of dense shrubs called napaka or scabiola. This napaka prevents the birds from nesting on the ground. Hence, they won't habitate in numbers. In the near future, a program to enhance habitation is to be carried out under the auspices of the Navy's Bureau of Aeronautics. The plan calls for the complete clearing of thickets and the recontouring of the terrain. It is hoped these measures will entice the albatrosses to nest here. Professors Hubert and wife Mabel Franges, zoologist of Penn State University, points out that this island is nowhere nearly supporting the number of albatrosses that it could. And there is Lysiansky Island. Here on Lysiansky, the 1957 estimate brought out that the Goonie population stood at about 95,000 Laysons and 7,000 Blackfoot. The Penn State professors said that the land area here could support over a million nesting birds. So from these figures, we can see that only a small fraction of the possible numbers nest on this island. Further, here on Laysan, zoologists have determined that there is room for more nesting birds. Even though it, Laysan, along with Midway, are the two principal breeding atolls of the albatrosses. Now, between these two islands, that is Laysan and Midway, researchers estimate that three quarters of the total nesting birds do so here. So, as we have seen, there are other homes available to the Goonie. But something like 35,000 of these obstinate creatures seem determined to nest and brood here on sand, the one island of the lot where they're bothered incessantly by a 24-hour-a-day activity, noise and perils imposed by aircraft and other type vehicles. In fact, to all other known types of bird life, such constant harassment would cause complete disgust and a departure with gusto. But not the Goonies. In spite of the most strenuous efforts and craftiest schemes to divert them to the other more desirable islands nearby, they get more stubborn and run rampant in anger by attempts to oust them. Such determination used to bring about laughter. But the Cold War, backed up by modern science and technology, has changed all that. In the meantime, the flight and the work has to go on. So does the one-sided battle, bird against man. The government has and will expend hundreds of thousands of tax dollars for goonie bird nesting. Would it not be prudent to displace these birds from this vital early warning base? How? Certainly we laymen can't solve this problem, but someone has to, and soon. Meanwhile, the men who fly the radar sentinels and the island residents alike We'll watch them fly away in July on their journeys to the far reaches of the northern Pacific. But thousands of them will be back in October and November. On that, you can depend. The residents will again be amused by the Goonies antics. And the flight personnel will again be in danger. And the battle for Midway will start its 1960 cycle. A cycle that may claim the lives of many of our airmen. Unless positive action is taken
to claim this one small, this one small but important island for the undisputed use of our vital sentinel in the North Pacific Ocean. And now we will go to the Barbers Point Naval Air Station on Oahu and meet the Barrier Commander, Rear Admiral Benjamin E. Moore, in his Pacific Barrier Headquarters. It is true that the Gooner Barge provide a source of amusement to the people who live out on isolated Midway Island. But this feeling is derived solely from the amusement value of the Gooney Bird. To those of us who have to fly the Pacific Barrier, the Gooney Bird is a source of danger. Our feelings are based on the facts during the operation of the Barrier for this past year. The facts are that the barrier operation are uh, being disrupted to an intolerable degree by these obstinate goonie birds. This is done by their being imposing a tremendous workload on our aircraft maintenance crews and more importantly they are causing tremendous mental and physical stresses on our flight personnel. I can think of no military operation having to undergo such harassment and his people being so helpless on means of self-protection. The scenes you have seen thus far were made during the last week of May of this year, the period when most of the adult gooners have departed and the young birds are still too small to be flying. But it suffices to acquaint you with the geographical setting, the birds, and our Pacific Barrier operation. Two, it offered you the chance to see the other islands in the chain from, from Hawaii, which could absorb the Sand Island Goonie Bird population with the greatest of ease. To orient you with the area in which we are talking about, Hawaii is 2,091 miles west of San Francisco, and Midway is 1,149 miles northwest of Hawaii, with a chain of small islands extending all the way from Hawaii to Midway. This is a diagram of Sand Island, which is our operating base out at Midway, with the runway shown in blue, and the, good, the primary nesting area of the albatross shown in red. Of course, the gooners nest all over the entire island and fly back and forth over these runways. But our primary problem area is along this runway, which unfortunately is also our most heavily used runway. Dr. Frings, the zoologist from Penn State University, who made a study of the albatross problem for the Navy last year, reported that the albatross population on Sand Island is lower this year than it was in the immediate preceding year. This may be true. But it is also a fact that since the 1st of January of this year, we've suffered no, nearly double the number of bird strikes which were sustained in the whole of 1958. <coughs> Going into figures, dealing so, we'll deal solely with the Goonie bird problem. Well, although there are thousands of other birds, like the city tern and the frigate bird, who nest on Midway, Gooners are the only bird which provide us with a real hazard problem in flight. <coughs> uh, since we have started our operation, there have been 538 Gooney bird strikes on the aircraft of the early morning wing. Of these 538, 227 caused damage at a material cost of $80,312 the aircraft will have been grounded for a total of 75 days and with a depreciation of $700 per day and the lack loss of the use of the aircraft, this represents an operational loss of $52,850 on our capital equipment. These strikes caused a workload on our maintenance personnel of 2,520 man hours. Estimating that the average Navy aircraft mechanic draws $2 an hour in wages and allowances, salaries for these repairs 
came to $5,040. There were 33 flights aboarded due to Goonie Bird strikes. When a plane aborts on takeoff, he has to dump about 3,000 gallons of fuel to bring his aircraft down to the maximum safe landing weight. 3,000 gallons of gasoline at prices to the Navy represents about $540. 33 aborts times $540 for each one means $17,800 in gasoline which was dumped in the ocean because of the Goonie Bay. <coughs> Totaling <coughs> all these costs, we find that 227 Goonie Bird strikes have cost the government $156,000. Think of the corresponding increase in logistic support requirements imposed and numerous intangibles. But let's turn to a more important set of factors. Here is a radome which is over six feet high which was struck by one goonie bird. That radome cost $11,000 and one goonie bird ruined it completely. Here, a goonie bird struck at the junction of the wing and the fuselage of the airplane. And here is the hole that that goonie bird left at this critical point in the aircraft structure. It's unbelievable the size and the uh, amount of damage that these goonie birds do. How would you like to have been in this aircraft when a hole of that size was placed between the wing? and the fuselage of the aircraft. Here's an even more serious bit of damage. The Goonie Bird struck the vertical stabilizer of this plane on takeoff. Now consider what would have happened had one of these Goonie Bird strikes been on the pilot's windshield. Our personnel are assigned in minimum numbers for the support of the barrier program. Flight crews are home based at Barber's Point on Oahu and deployed to Midway for 18 days out of every 34 days. Our maintenance personnel are divided approximately half at Barber's Point and the other half at Midway. The Midway contingent works for three days and are off for one day. But for the past few months, this has not been true. To keep the aircraft flying, Numerous men have had to work 70-hour work weeks. Now for a typical flight crew schedule. A pre-flight preparing the aircraft for the mission takes about four hours. The flight is 14 to 15 hours, and they spend about an hour after the flight checking out the discrepancies which have occurred. A total of 19 to 20 hours of continuous work for a flight crew. They rest for about 32 hours, and then are off on another flight. This cycle continues for 18 days of a deployment at Midway. An aborted flight means a hole in the barrier. This hole can't be filled unless we either launch the next planned crew early or launch the aborted crew in a replacement aircraft. Neither of these procedures are operationally sound because by advancing the crew launching schedule in proportion to the number of aborts, we create an unacceptable chain reaction. It would play havoc with the complete operational schedule. In the interest of flight safety, it is deemed unacceptable to launch the aborted crew in a replacement aircraft. This would pose a severe fatigue problem brought about by approximately eight hours of work preceding a 3,000 mile flight a flight demanding the uttermost in diligence. We are not allotted extra aircraft and personnel to compensate for these adverse factors imposed by the Goonie Bird. The culmination of these factors are taking their toll and making themselves apparent in the men's morale, for there is overwork, danger, and the integrity of the barrier is being seriously threatened. This is the true price being paid by the personnel who must live with this problem. Many of them feel, and I cannot disagree, that it's just a matter of time until an aircraft and its crew are lost. Considering these facts, 
The issue is simply this. It's either remove the goony birds from Midway Sand Island and keep them in, or keep the birds and eventually bury a flight crew of 22 men. I hope I'll never have the task of explaining to some mother or wife that her son or husband was killed by this. <laughs>